Hey, so this is the lecture then for Monday, should be the um, 12th of October. If you're following along in the syllabus then, um, we are going to have our next exam on Friday. At the moment, I'm pretty sure I can get through the rest of Chapter 6 then in uh, with, uh, with Monday and Wednesday. And so if you look on the As You Learn site then, you'll find um, some, some resources then to help you get ready then for the second exam. Uh, this includes uh, the updated equation sheet that has all the new equations on it. Um, there is a recording of me walking through some sort of sample problems uh, from this chapter that involve math. I know um, a lot of folks get a little bit of anxiety about uh, about there being math on the, t on the test, and this just walks through a couple of the example problems and, and how to approach them. Um, and again, I'm hoping to uh, you know get through Chapter 6 by the end of Wednesday, and if that's the case, then the exam will be Friday. And like the last exam, it's really Friday up till Sunday night to take it, so you have the whole weekend then um, to go through everything and to get ready and to study for it. So um, with luck, we can, uh, we can get this done. And as always, you know, if you have questions about this stuff, come see me. And finally then, you know, just a reminder, um, this is it for, um, you know, the, the mathy physics-y stuff. After this chapter, we're going to sort of skip over the sun and jump to chapter eight and start talking about the solar system and then the planets and comets and asteroids um, and all the good stuff. But we have to lay this, this foundation, though. Um, so as we, we go through and we talk about different things and, you know, how, we've, how we're able to figure out the temperature of a planet, something like that, um, you, you know where that's coming from. So uh, bear with me. Um, this is probably this one and probably the next lecture are the most mathematical physics-y uh, lectures and physics -y, if that's like a real word. Um, but, but these are probably the uh, chapters you're going to like the least, unless you're a physics major or a math major or really interested in science and stuff. But again, it's important. So when we talk about things, so you know, how do we measure how fast a star is moving? Um, you can look back on this chapter and go, why? Yes, you used the Doppler shift to measure that. So um, bear with me. Okay, so um, we left off. We were talking about this idea, the Stefan Boltzmann uh, law. This idea, if I have an object then that's dense or liquid or even, uh, you know, a solid or a dense, uh, a dense gas then, and it has any heat associated with it, the atoms and molecules then making up that object are vibrating. Wait a minute, atoms and molecules are charged particles. I have accelerating charged particles. They create magnetic fields, which in turn can create electric fields, which create magnetic fields. And the next thing I know, I'm talking about light. And so this idea of an object sitting there, if it's if it's hot and, and solid or liquid or a dense gas, then it's going to be giving off light. And the question then is what colors that light, what wavelength, what frequency is most of that light being emitted at? Technically, a black body then, it emits the light at all the colors of the rainbow, but there'll be a certain frequency, wavelength, color, energy then that most of the light will be coming out at. And that's set by the temperature. And that's Wien's law. And I'm not sure if I, I, I circled back on this, but the idea of a black body. So if I'm sitting in my room here and um, I've got a black body in the room with me, remember it's a perfect absorber of, of light and it's also a, a perfect emitter. And so it's emitting uh, because it's a solid object with a temperature associated with it, but it's absorbing all the light that strikes it. So I look at it, all the light, you know, that's hitting this object then gets absorbed. Oh, the object is black. Well, what about it emitting light though? You go, well, wait a minute, a perfect absorber is also a perfect emitter. Oh, wait a minute, though. If I think about the temperature of stuff in this room, it's like, what, 280 Kelvin, something like that. Then do the stuff in Boltzmann, or sorry, do the Wien's Law thing, figure out the peak wavelength that the light's coming out at. It's in the infrared. And so this object, then, even though it's a perfect emitter of radiation of light because it's a black body, because it's at room temperature, then almost all of that light is coming out in the infrared, which my eye can't see. So I have an object that's sitting there, all the light that strikes it gets absorbed, the light it's re-emitting from that, you know, that energy that it's absorbed, that light that it's absorbed, and all the energy it's re-emitting though is being re-emitted in the infrared. My eye can't see that. So to me as a human being, it looks black. If I had an infrared camera with me, though, I'd be, oh, look at that thing glow, because um, it's, it's re-radiating, it's giving off that energy uh, in the infrared because it's a black body. 
And the other thing to talk about then is the total amount of energy that something's giving off because it's got heat associated with it. And it's, it's giving off that light as a black body. Um, if I talk about the total energy per second, then that it's radiating in the form of light and energy per second, then um, that's power. And give me a second to, I always forget uh, to switch to the laser pointer. There we go. Um, the total power or energy per unit time, then, um, that's just a measure, really, of how much total light the thing is emitting. Well, it turns out that depends on the area of the object. The more area it has, the more radiating surface it has. It also depends on this constant sigma, which we're not going to worry about. It also, though, depends on the temperature of the object, then, to the fourth power. And so if you talk about how much light something is giving off because it's a black body and it's got a temperature associated with it, then um, it's and again, I, I don't I should have gone back and erased it. I don't like the word brightness. I much, 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 much prefer the word um, luminosity, the total amount of light then that, that it gives off. Then that's the luminosity. It depends on its size or its surface area and its temperature. And you know this, though, if you've got an electric burner on your stove, and in this case, I know, look, we've got two electric burners. We've got a little one and a big one, and I take them and I turn them both on high. And as I watch them heat up, then they start glowing sort of a dull red, and then they, they sort of get brighter and, and sort of more orangish then um, as they heat up. And, you know, something like this, you know, that's pretty hot for a burner because you see all this light coming off. You go, oh, that's pretty hot. And, and you think about, well, I've got this big pot I want to boil the water in. Do I put it on the little burner or the big burner? Both of those burners are at the same temperature. But if I've got a big pot, I want to put as much energy, as much heat into that pot as possible. I put it on the big burner because both of those two burners and each one of them, each square centimeter, then each square inch, each square meter, whatever, because they're at the same temperature, is putting off the same amount of light. Well, that big burner, though, it has more surface area. It has more square centimeters. And, and each of those square centimeters is giving off a certain amount of light. Well, more square centimeters, more light. That's the same thing for stars. So electric oven stars, meh, same thing. So when we talk about this, when we talk about the total power or light then that's being emitted by something because it's hot then, it depends on the area of the object. And if you think about a, a sphere then, the area depends on the radius squared, the surface area of a sphere, of a sphere then, 4 pi r squared. So the area depends on the size of the surface squared, or I should say, the, the area depends on the radius squared. That's a better way to say it. The size of the surface, the surface area depends on the radius squared. So if we double the radius of an object, oh, the power, the amount of light that it's giving off then goes up by a factor of two squared because I have four times more area if I double the radius. If I triple the radius, now I have nine times more area. And so the, the amount of light then it gives off goes up by a factor of nine. If I quadruple the the, the, the I'll slow down. If I quadruple the radius of the object, then the surface area goes up by a factor of 16, the increase in radius squared, and, and so I get then 16 times more light from that object. So the total amount of light then depends on the radius squared. I'm talking about radius here because we're interested in stars, and those are roughly spherical, so there's a lot of spheres here. Um, think about, though, also what happens if we change the temperature. So the total amount of light being given off by the object depends on the temperature to the fourth power. And so if I double the temperature of the object, well, I'm doubling it, I'm multiplying the temperature by two. Well, the power depends on the temperature to the fourth power. So if I double the temperature, well, the change in, in power then, the change in what's coming out then, that depends on the temperature to the fourth power. If I double the temperature, I've got two to the fourth power. That's my change in temperature to the fourth power. Uh, I've got 16 times more light then coming off the object. If I triple the temperature, I get three to the fourth or 81 times more light coming off the object. If I quadruple the temperature, I get four to the fourth power, 256 times more light then uh, coming off the object. And so the total amount of light that something's giving off then, uh, it really, really depends on temperature to the fourth power. And any change I make to the temperature, well, that change gets raised to the fourth power when I'm talking about the total amount of light that's giving off at that, because the amount of light then depends on that temperature um, to the fourth power. So you can go and you can start talking about or thinking about, I guess, uh, stars. And so maybe we have two stars here. They're the same size, but they have different temperatures. So I have a red star um, and a blue star. Which one's going to be the hotter star? The red star or the blue star? 
you know, hoping to go, oh, yeah, that's a Wien's law thing. Then the hotter it is, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy, the bluer the light. This blue star is going to have a hotter surface uh, temperature um, than this red star. And if I want to compare the total amount of light they're giving the, that they're giving off, say, um, oh, I don't know, maybe the, the red star has a temperature of uh, 3,000 Kelvin and the blue star then has a temperature of 7,000 Kelvin, something like that. They have the, the their sizes, though, are the same. So their, their areas then are the same because their radii are the same. So from the cooler star, because the, the power depends on the temperature to the fourth power, I'm raising a smaller temperature, a smaller number to the fourth power. I'm going to get less light then coming from the cool star than I am then from the, from the hotter star. And so if they're at the same distance and they're in the, the same size, then um, the brighter star then, or the more, the hotter star then is going to be the brighter star. It's giving off uh, more light. Uh, what if then, if I have two stars, uh, same temperature and color, but they're of different size. So maybe I've got a small star and a big star. Which one's going to give off uh, more light? I'll give you a second to ponder that. But yeah, we got one star that's smaller, one star that's bigger. So the smaller star then has a smaller surface area. The bigger star has the bigger surface area or the bigger area. He says this is hard. Uh, but they have the same temperature, so that doesn't matter. The sigma and t to the fourth are the same for both of these stars. It's just the bigger star then has the bigger area. So the smaller star with a smaller area, if the a is smaller, sigma and t are both the same. I'm going to get a smaller power, less light than uh, from the smaller star. From the bigger star, then I'm going to get more light. And so again, if they're at the same distance and they have the same temperature, the bigger star is going to be putting out more light. And so that's going to be then the brighter of the two stars. All right. What about this question then? I've got two stars. They're different temperatures, therefore different colors, but also different sizes. And this one turns out to be tricky because you can look at it and you go, okay, I got a small red star and I've got a big blue star. And all right, uh, okay, um, so the, the light output then is going to depend on the small area times the, the smaller temperature to the fourth power. The, the bigger star then, um, it's going to have a bigger area. Oh, it's also though the hotter star. So if I have a case where I have a small red star and a big blue star, maybe it's not so confusing because the small red star has got a small area, it's got a lower temperature. The combination of these two numbers, the sigma is the same between the two. I just need to look at the two numbers that are different. Um, these are both smaller uh, than the case of the big blue star. And so I'm going to get less light in the small red star because it's smaller. I'm going to get less light in the small red star because it's cooler as opposed to the big blue star, bigger area, more light, higher temperature, more light. Again, if they're at the same distance, then the big blue star is putting out more light. It's going to be then uh, the brighter of the stars. But what about this situation, though? Now, I've got a small blue star and a big red star. Ah, all right. So for the small blue star, then you go, oh, um, its area is small, so it's putting out less light. Oh, but its temperature is higher, so it's putting out more light when compared to the, the big red star, which is putting out more light because its area is larger, but it's putting out less light because its temperature is smaller. And in this case, without knowing the specific numbers, without actually knowing the real values to put in, you can't answer the problem. So it could be um, it could be a much, 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 much smaller star, but only a tiny bit hotter. And so the smallness is what di dictates the light output. And then the small blue star will be putting out less light than the big red star. Or it could be could be the reverse. Well, so how about a specific example then? We've got a star then. Um, Looking at it, it's one star. Star A has got a surface temperature of 5,400 Kelvin. Star B is exactly the same size, the same radius, but um, it has a surface temperature that's 33,000 degrees Kelvin, so it's cooler. So star B then, 3,000 Kelvin. Star A, 5,400 Kelvin, both the same size. Um, it, if we assume they're emitting like black bodies, which is pretty safe for stars, then let's compare the brightnesses of the two stars. How much light is one star putting out? How many times more light is, is maybe one star putting out compared to the other? I'll maybe look at a ratio. And I'll give you a second to give this problem a try. And you can hit pause and, and give it a go. And all right, what we want to look then, we're talking about the difference in the amount of light that they're putting out then. This will be the, the difference then, or I should say the ratio in the amount of light then they're putting out. This will be the ratio of their powers. And for star A, the power it's putting out will be its its 
area A times sigma times its temperature to the fourth power. So A, 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 sigma T to the fourth, or T A to the fourth for star A. And then star B then, we've got its area A, B times that same sigma uh, times T B to the fourth power. So this is just the power from star A on the top, the star power from star B on the bottom. And right away, I notice something though. The cancel fairy can come visit. Both have sigma on the top and on the bottom. Those things cancel. But I also know star A is the same size as star B. So how are their, how are their areas different? If they have the same radii, if they have the same size, well, wait, they're the same. Star A and B have the same area. That cancels out as well. And so really the ratio of the powers or the light then that they're putting out, the energy that they're putting out then, it's just the ratio of their temperatures to the fourth power. Wait, I can plug that in then. I just need the ratio of 5,400 to the fourth to 3,000 to the fourth. And if I don't want to like to use, you know, press a lot of buttons on my calculator, I realize I can, I can just uh, pull to the to the fourth outside and do it then it's just 5,400 divided by 3,000 to the fourth power. If you don't want to take that step, you don't have to. It's just going to be more button pressing for you. So it's up to you, um, which that ratio 5,400 to 3,000 is 1.8. So the answer is going to be 1.8 to the ratio. Oh, sorry. The answer is going to be the ratio to the fourth power or 1.8 to the fourth power, the ratio of their temperatures to the fourth power, 1.8 to the fourth power, 10.5. And so that means then star A is putting out about 10 and a half times more light than star B or more power than star B or star A, if they're, they're at the same distance, then uh, it's going to be 10 and a half times brighter than star B. All right, I got to take a quick, quick uh, second uh, to go do something. I will be right back. Okay, so the next thing to talk about. Um, all right. Well, we've got this idea that you can take a prism and you can split the, you know, you can run light through it and you can split that light then up into its component colors. And so here's just, uh, we can't do this. Um, you know, I can't, I can't drive over to your house or your, your apartment or your dorm room or, or whatever and do this. But here's the experiment though, where we've been, then basically got a, uh, a light source and I got to get my, laser pointed. There we go. We've got a light source here and we've got basically a little piece of cardboard here has a slit in it. Just lets a, a sort of narrow beam of the light go through from this, this light source here and uh, into this prism. And you know what happens when the light hits the prism, right? It gets dispersed um, into its colors. And so here's what it looks like. Then we've taken the light then from two different light sources. One is an incandescent light, and we talked about that a little while ago. That's the fancy way of saying a light bulb with a filament in it, a piece of tungsten, which gets hot. Oh, it's hot, it's tungsten, it's a metal, it's a solid. Um, it's it's gonna radiate like a black body, and I heat it up to 6,000 Kelvin, and I'm gonna get a lot of light out of it, and the light is gonna look an awful lot like sunlight uh, in terms of colors and the distribution of the colors from it. Fine, all right, it's a black body source. Another source of light, though, what might be one of those compact fluorescent bulbs, something like that, where I can take a different kind of a light bulb, a compact, compact fluorescent light bulb, take its light and run it through the prism and split up its light up in, into its colors. And what happens, though, um, is I see something different. And here, here it sort of is blown up a little bit, where this is the incand incandescent light source, the black body source, the light's going through the split, being split by the prism then, spread out by the prism. And yeah, I see all the colors of the rainbow, red, orange, green, indigo, violet, blue, you know, all of the colors there. Um, well, wait a minute though. When I, when I take the, the fluorescent, the compact fluorescent light bulb and I send its light through, I get something that looks completely different. I've got colors then, um, that are actually missing. Yes, I've got red, but where the heck's yellow? And I've got green, but but then beyond sort of in here, then there's nothing. And maybe I've got this blue band here, but where's my indigo? Where's my violet? It looks different. Um, and it's a different kind of spectrum, or it's a different sort of distribution of colors then coming off that fluorescent light bulb. So what does that mean? Right off the just thinking about that for a second, why would I have um the light coming off these two different light bulbs? Why would the light look so different. And it turns out it's two different processes then that are creating the light. The, the, the incandescent light bulb here is doing the black body thing. It's giving off all the colors of the rainbow. Yes, it peaks in sort of a yellowish, orangish, sunlightish looking light. Um, but this is producing light by a different process. Oh, all right. 
And that's what we're going to talk about next. And, and this idea, though, that you can go out and you can take the light from an object and you can split it into its colors. And if it's coming from a black body that happens to be warm enough to, to be emitting light, um, enough light at, at high enough frequencies, high enough energy, short enough wavelengths, and for visible light, um, you'll see, as we talked about them from black bodies, uh, all the colors of the rainbow. When we talk about this then as a continuous black body, it's a, a continuous spectrum from a black body. It's a continuous distribution of colors. One color then flows right into the next, and there are no gaps or breaks or anything like that. And, and you know, it's a continuous distribution of light. Yes, it's going to peak maybe at one wavelength color frequency or energy that corresponds to the temperature, but overall, you got all the colors, all the wavelengths, and all the frequencies. They're all represented. That's different then from an emission line spectrum, where like for the case of that fluorescent light, when you take it and you look at the light you're getting from it, then you see some red light, but then no colors till you get to this sort of uh, tealish, uh, greenish blue sort of, okay, I'm getting some greenish blue sort of light out of it, but then nothing until I'm getting some blue and maybe some violet. It turns out for those of you who really enjoy this sort of stuff like me um, you can look right at that and go oh that's a hydrogen spectrum that's coming from hydrogen atoms but um we'll get there but that that's the idea though it's a very very different kind of spectrum it's a very very different distribution of light and as we'll see later then um actually see pretty soon um it's it's because that light in the case of an emission line spectrum then is being produced by a different process the black body is giving off light because the objects uh, is made of atoms and molecules and they're sitting there vibrating and some are vibrating a little faster some are vibrating a little slower and there's sort of a continuous distribution of speeds yes it's peaked at one frequency or one wavelength, but you know, you've got, they're all there. Um, as opposed to the emission line spectrum where we've only got very specific colors, frequencies, wavelengths, energies, and being emitted by the object. And what's up with that? Well, all right. We're talking about then how matter is, is emitting light here with the continuous, you know, the black body spectrum then. And also then for, from different use emission line spectra, it helps to understand then really what matter's made up of. And I've sort of danced around this and sort of assumed that we've talked about it when in reality we haven't. So maybe we should, maybe we should just back up a second and think about, well, what's matter made out of? And hopefully this is stuff you've seen before. Oh, please tell me you've seen this before. The idea then that all matter is made up of atoms. And you can string atoms together into molecules, long chains of atoms, or even just a couple of atoms stuck together, like water is one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms stuck together. Or you can have complex molecules then uh, stuck together like DNA, things like that. But it, it's basically all made up, all matter then is made up of these tiny particles called atoms. And the atoms themselves are made up of particles. And there are three kinds of particles then that you're going to find then making up atoms. You've got protons, and you find those in the center of the atom, or, and this is like the two cent cartoon here. I'm sorry, I'm just not good with the art. But again, you've seen this before. Um, well, you've got then the very, very center of the atom, then the nucleus. And that's where you'll find the protons. And the pro protons then have positive charges. And we'll just see, a, we'll just call it a, a positive charge of plus one. So every proton then has a charge of plus one. I'm just going to make my life easier. I'm just going to call that plus one. Um, also, though, another type of particle that makes up atoms then, and you'll find these also in the nucleus then, these would be the neutrons. And guess what electrical charge the neutrons have? Yeah, none. They have no electrical charge. So you've got protons and neutrons and at the at the center of these atoms and at the nucleus of the at these atoms, well, all atoms, not just these atoms, all atoms, it's made up of protons and neutrons. Surrounding the protons and neutrons then are other small subatomic particles of the third kind. These are referred to as electrons. And yes, I'm presuming you can read, these have negative charges. And they sort of um, orbit around the positively charged nucleus because it has protons, they orbit around the, the positively charged nucleus like a swarm of bees almost. And you can imagine, well, what are they doing there? Oh, wait a minute. The, the nucleus then, because of the protons, has a positive charge. The electrons have a negative charge and opposites attract. Um, and so there we go. The, the, the electrons then are held 
in orbit around the center set of the, the, the atoms and held in orbit around the nuclei then by an electrostatic force or an electric force. They're positive and negative charges attract each other. And there are two ways to really sort of look at it. You can take a sort of classical look at it where here we've got helium then. So this nucleus here at the center then would consist of two protons and two neutrons if it's normal helium. Um, and so the, the nucleus then has a charge of plus two because it's got two protons and the two neutrons don't contribute anything. Thing. And going around it then would be two electrons. And, and you can almost think of them like actual, you know, particles, almost like little tiny basketballs um, or moons um, in orbit around the nucleus here. You can think about them then as, as actual individual particles. But in reality, the world on the quantum scale is weird and wacky. Um, we've got courses in that and quantum mechanics and stuff if you really want to get into it. But one of the ideas then is on very, very tiny scales, and there's not much difference between particles and waves. And we sort of saw that with light. And this idea then that you can think about, you know, here's the nucleus, and it's it's not surrounded actually sort of by two particles and, you know, basketballs going around the nucleus end, but actually sort of a, a, a sort of cloud where the, the electron then is actually really sort of a probability wave around the nucleus. And at that point you go, oh, for, for the sake of this class, so um, we'll probably stick with more of a planetary uh, model like this. And it's not, it's not one that's going to quite keep you up um, awake at night. But in, in reality then, um, where the electron is then is actually really just a probability. I can't really just take a stick and poke at it as it's going by at that specific point at that specific time. As always, if you have questions about that, let me know. But just, just for the sake of simplicity, though, we will just consider them um, little balls going around the nucleus. And so, you know, we're talking about atoms that make up matter. And if you think about matter, then, oh gosh, all matter, uh, you, can, you can break these atoms down in, into types um, or different elements. And uh, when you're talking about the different elements then, that make up matter, it really comes down to the number of protons then, that are in the nucleus. All hydrogen nuclei have one proton. All helium nuclei have two protons. All lithium nuclei have three protons. Carbon has six, nitrogen has seven, oxygen has eight. I'm not gonna make you remember all that, except you probably should know hydrogen one is one, helium has two protons and the rest, whatever. Um, but so when you're, when you're talking to physicists and chemists, sometimes their language is a little bit different, but the idea is we talk about the atomic number then for the element, for a different element, different elements. And, and this is the number of protons then that are in the nucleus. And that determines then the electrical charge of the nucleus. And if we say each proton then is sporting plus one, um, in this case for carbon, which has six protons, its atomic number is six and the charge on its nucleus then is plus six because it's got then um, those, uh, those six protons. And so looking at it then, we've got atomic number and symbol. These are actually the same thing. If you tell me the atomic number then is um, 26, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, oh, that's iron. And, and that just comes from, from doing this for a while and working with, uh, working with atoms and, and nuclei and stuff like that. But they're really the same thing. Um, all right, so uh, we've got then this idea that the atomic number is really just the number of protons in the nucleus end, which really is determining the, the element then. So hydrogen, one proton, carbon, six protons, uranium, 92 protons. And also though, um, you can look at this other thing on here. Well, we've got the symbol C, carbon, Oh, C, carbon, white one at least makes sense. And then also here is the atomic mass. And that's really, um, if you leave off the decimal point or you round it then to the nearest whole number, that's really just the mass number. And mass number is not quite the same as atomic mass. Oh gosh, how much do we want to get into that? Because really, if you think about... Um, different nuclei, there's different bindings and you know, different, the, the nuclei then are pulled together with different um, amounts of force. And that translates into energy, which is slight mass differences. Oh, good Lord, we're not going down that road. Just basically the atomic mass, if you just look at it, round it up, round it down, then the total is going to be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus. And that's referred to then as the mass number. And really the idea is protons and neutrons have one atomic mass 
and there you go. So if you've got an atomic mass of two, you know you've got two particles in in the nucleus, and if it's hydrogen, one of them's got to be a proton because it's hydrogen. So the next one, the other, the other particle then has to be a neutron. And um, gosh, we can talk about this. We can also talk about, though, um, if you walk around and you look at, at atoms, look at your hand. Most of the hydrogen uh, atoms then that are bound up in the molecules of your hand, they consist of one proton in the nucleus. And that's fine. Although if you look in nature, you can run across some hydrogen nuclei, some hydrogen atoms then, with nuclei that have an additional proton, or sorry, an additional neutron in them. And, and likewise for carbon, if you look at the carbon in your hand, then 89% um, of it uh, by, by number then um, is made up of carbon 12, 12, 12, carbon 12. And you go, wait a minute, that's carbon, that's six protons. The, the, uh, the atomic mass number is 12. So it must be six protons, six neutrons. You know, most of your hand is made up of that stuff. But, you know, every uh, out of every hundred carbon atoms, then um, a 10 or 11 of them then actually are sporting an extra neutron, carbon 13. And even also mixed in there, or even, even a little bit of carbon 14. So this idea that we've got elements out there like hydrogen, most of the hydrogen out there, one proton, zero neutrons, mass number of one. There is, though, some hydrogen out there, though, that's sporting. Um, this is referred to as deuterium. It's, it's one proton, so it's hydrogen, but it's also then sporting an extra neutron. Chemically, it behaves like hydrogen because it still has one proton and it's hydrogen. It's just got more mass because it has an extra neutron then in the nucleus. And that doesn't really change anything other than the mass because the neutron has no electrical charge. So it has a mass number of, of two. Carbon then, typical carbon in your hand, six protons, six neutrons, mass number of 12. Um, and thinking about then, well, some of that carbon, um, uh, there's also, though, a little bit of the carbon-13, and there's carbon-14 then that's in, in your hand. Carbon-14, six protons, eight neutrons, and a mass number then of 14. All right, sorry about that. I usually don't do edits, but uh, we don't have a lot of time, and I went into like a four-minute discussion of uh, carbon-12 versus carbon-14, which actually decays over time, um, and, and how that can be used to... to basically radioactively date um, things here on Earth. And um, if you want to know more about that, come see me in the office hours. Um, but we, we sort of do need to need to keep moving here. Um, another thing to talk about then is, is I've already sort of mentioned it a couple times, the number of protons in the nucleus sort of determines, um, you know, what element we're going to call it, like hydrogen, that always one proton, helium, that always two protons. And, and what's up with that? And the idea then is that in an electrically neutral atom, you've got you know a certain number of protons in the nucleus. You're going to have the same number of electrons then in orbit then around that nucleus. And looking at that then, it's those electrons that determine the chemical properties. And in a neutral atom, then the number of electrons are equal to the number of protons. So really, in, in effect, it is the number of protons that's determining the, the electrical and the chemical behavior of that atom. And that's why different numbers of protons, we refer to them then as different elements. That's what's going on here. But, you know, okay, in a typical neutral atom, then the number of protons is equal to the number of electrons. If I look at the carbon atoms in my hand, I've got six protons, six neutrons in most of them. And I'll then also have six electrons then going around um, those nuclei, and they'll be electrically neutral. Those plus six charges, or so the plus six electrical charge from the protons then is balanced by the minus six electrical charge um, from the electrons and going around. And so it's electrically neutral. Oh, man. All right. I got a dog barking at me. I will be, I will be right back. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Um, it's good. Okay. All right. Um, ah, the whole idea then. In a typical atom, then, the number of protons and the number of electrons then are equal to each other. It's electrically neutral. But we can find, though, atoms that are out there that have maybe lost an electron or even, even oddly enough, can, can gain an electron. And when that happens, then um, the atom becomes electrically charged. If I have, a, if I have a, an atom here and I strip an electron off, I've got you know the number of protons here. I've got a positive charge. I'm down a negative charge, though, from the electrons. I've removed one of the electrons. Say, if I'm looking then at a carbon atom, six protons, six electrons. If I strip one of those electrons off, now I've got six positively charged protons, but only five negatively charged uh, electrons. And I've got a net positive charge then 
of one. And believe it or not, that's actually what happens when you, um, oh, I don't know, we've all done this. You walk around on the carpet then and you sort of slide your feet on the carpet. You don't pick them up. Um, essentially what's happening is the rubbing between the rubber uh, soles of your, your shoes and the carpet your, the, the rubber soles uh, on your shoes and are actually pulling electrons then off the carpet. And you end up then with a net negative charge. You've, you've ionized yourself. You have more electrons uh, than you have protons. You have a net negative charge. And the carpet then, because it's had some electrons removed, uh, the carpet then gets a net positive charge. So it'll have more um, um uh, it'll have more protons than it will electrons. So you've got an excess of electrons. You've got a net negative charge. You're ionized and, and you sort of, then you walk around, you're looking for your little brother or your sister or the cat or something uh, to give them some of those electrons with the, the spark and the shock and everything. But that's what's going on. And so when you've got an atom and the number of electrons and protons, they don't balance each other. There's a net electrical charge. We talk about that atom then as ionized. And this is one of those things in astronomy then that is, I don't, I don't know, I never know what to say about it then. It's the notation, though, of people who look at the light being given off by atoms then. And in the spectroscopic notation then, if the, if the atom is neutral, it gets a Roman numeral one. If it's had one electron removed, it gets the Roman numeral two. If it's had three electrons removed, sorry, if it's had two electrons removed, it gets the Roman numeral three. Um, and if it's gained an electron, then it just gets a little minus sign behind it then because it's got a net negative charge. And typically you can only add one electron to an atom. And so you only talk about then um, really just a single negative sign then uh, behind the atom. But it's it's confusing um, because you can talk about silicon-4, how many electrons has it has it has have been removed? Silicon-4 has last, lost how many electrons? And in a sane world, you'd look at that and go, Four. It's lost four because it's silicon four. But no. Um, remember, you're starting from, you know, the neutral atom being a one. And so um, what that means then is one is neutral, two is lost one, three has lost two, four then um, means you've lost then um, three electrons. And so um, looking at that, yeah, the neutral state then minus the, the, the um, how do we want to say it? The ionization state minus the neutral state, that's the number of electrons lost because you're starting from one. So four minus one then is actually three electrons lost. All right. Why are we talking about all this? Um, we're getting there. And we got a, one last thing to think about or one last thing to look at before we can talk really about how these atoms and their electrons then end up interacting with light is the actual sort of structure of the electrons and, and sort of ah, the energy levels. I hate just coming out with energy levels, but thinking about then, um, if you go back to the, the thinking about the electrons and its particles in orbit um, around the nucleus, um, what sort of orbits can the electrons have? And it turns out then that this was this one of the great contributions then of Niels Bohr um, was basically looking at this and coming to the realization that if you've got a nucleus and an electron going around it, well, there's a certain amount of light energy associated with that. And this energy is a lot like gravity, where if I want to take the electron and I want to move it to a higher orbit, so I've got my phone and I want to move it to a higher orbit around the Earth, then I have to do work to move it away from the nucleus or move my phone away from the Earth, then I have to do work. I have to put energy into it. And so I can have these orbits that the electrons can be in, and there'll be a lowest possible orbit that's the least possible amount of energy, and then higher and higher orbits, then bigger and bigger orbits, more and more distance between the electron and the, 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 the nucleus, then, that, that correspond to higher and higher energies then. And, and that's okay. That's almost, that's, you know, that's thinking about almost, almost what you see going on with gravity and things in orbit around the Earth. I have to expend a lot more energy then to put something in a high Earth orbit versus putting something in a low Earth orbit. Or it takes me a lot less energy to just lift my phone this far away from the Earth as opposed to lifting my phone this far away from the Earth. All right, well, pr pretend my phone's a really big rock or something like that. You know what I'm talking about. The further away you have to have to move it, then the more energy it takes. And the same thing then for the electrons going around the nucleus. And the further away they are, they're orbiting, then the more energy it takes to get them out there or the more energy that orbit corresponds to. 
And so we talk about this idea of, you know, here's an electron then going around here. This is the lowest possible energy the electron can have. And well, maybe the, the electron will be going around here then. And this is a slightly higher orbit that corresponds to more energy. And this corresponds to even more energy. And okay, that, that's fine. That kind of makes sense. The big breakthrough, though, was the realization that the electron can only have certain very specific orbits. It can either be in an electron then, oh, I forgot my, I've lost my pointer. Oh, there we go. All right. So the electron can either be in orbit here or it can be in orbit here, or it can be in orbit here. It cannot be orbiting anywhere else in between. You'll never find the electron orbiting in here. You'll never find the electron orbiting in here. You'll never find the electron orbiting in here. It can only be here, 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 here. There are finite, definite energy levels that these electrons then, um, can have, and they can't have anything else. And so we talk about then the lowest possible energy level for this electron. This is the ground state or um, the first energy level, n equals one. If you give the, uh, how to say this, if you take the electron and, and you can get it up here, then this is a level then, an energy level, it corresponds to the electron having more energy. And, and, well, the electron likes to be in the ground state. And so if we find it up here in this state, then this is a higher energy level. This corresponds to more energy. We talk about that, then it's the second energy level or an excited state because the electron likes to be in the ground state. Who doesn't like to be in the ground state? The lowest possible energy uh, level possible. That's where we all want to be. And so, you know, but, you know, maybe the electron can be up here then in the second uh, second level then, uh, n equals two, or the first excited state, because you've got the first level, that's the ground state. This is the first excited state or the second energy level. Well, if the electron has even more energy, it can be up here then in the third level or the second excited state and so on. And the idea though, the thing to keep in mind is the electron can only have these very, very specific energies. It cannot have energies anywhere in between. And people sometimes sort of, you know, you get into why, what's going on here. And it goes back to, to thinking again of these particles, um, really not so much as little tiny basketballs, but as actual waves. And if you're, if you're doing the music thing, you can actually almost think of these energy levels then as harmonics in a vibrating string. And you think about a vibrating string, then it can have this frequency, this harmonic, or this frequency, this harmonic, but not a frequency, not a, not a pitch, a tone, a, a vibrational state that's in between. And so you can only get certain frequencies then out of the, out of the strings on a string, uh, on a, on a, well, on a stringed instrument. Then. It's the same sort of deal here, kind of, it's kind of like that then. So you can almost think of them as harmonics, but the big thing, the takeaway then is the electron can only be in this energy level or this energy level or this energy level or this energy level. And, uh, you know, if we, if you think about too high an energy level, um, you can actually give it too much energy and kick the electron then actually out of the atom. And we talk about that then as the ionization process. And uh, I don't know, another way to think about it then is this is almost like a bookshelf where I can put my book here. 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 I cannot put my book halfway between the shelves. It, there's nothing there uh, to support it. Um, but this is it then. This was the big breakthrough then of Bohr that you have these technically they're referred to as quantized energy levels. That's where the where the phrase the, the term quantum mechanics comes from because these these orbits and these electrons can only have very specific orbits, ground state, first excited, second excited, third excited state, and up. And so thinking about that though, this idea this is just true for all atoms. They can only have certain energies. Um okay, well how do we get how do we get the the electron then uh, from a low energy level uh, up to a higher energy level? I should say right from the beginning that if you take an atom and its electrons going around it then and you just put them in a box and you leave them alone, those electrons then are going to end up in the lowest possible energy state. They're going to end up then in the ground state. Nature likes things in the ground state. To kick them up to these higher excited states, then we somehow have to give these electrons energy. And you can think about two different ways then to give them energy and to kick them up then into these excited states. So here in this diagram then is an electron here. This is in the ground state, the little black dot in the center then is the, the nucleus. Got an electron just sort of going around here. You give it some energy though, and it can jump from that first energy level to the second energy level or to the first excited state. 
And, and you know, you can do that. You can give that energy, uh, that electron, then some energy. You have to be careful, though, because it has to be the exact amount of energy necessary to jump from this energy level to that energy level. If I give it too little, ener too little energy, um, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to jump to someplace in between these two levels, and that's not allowed. If I give it a little bit too much energy, then it'll jump above that, that first excited state then. Or, you know, it'll jump above, you know, this first excited state here. And that's not allowed. I have to be, I have to give it then just the exact amount of energy then to jump between these two states. And, okay, okay, well, okay, to jump up then to a higher energy level, I have to give it energy. That makes sense, conservation of energy. Uh, the same thing, though, the electron then being up here in one of these excited states with too much energy to jump back down to the ground state, which is where it wants to be, then it's got to get rid of that energy. And so it's also that the electron then to jump down then has to get rid of that extra energy. So we've got energy out here. And the energy that it has to get rid of then is the exact energy difference then between these two levels. It can't jump, you know, uh, here where there's, there's no level available to it. It's got to jump then from the second to the first energy level. It can't jump too far. It can't jump... Uh, too short, it's got to jump exactly to that energy level, and the energy it puts out has to be equal then to that energy uh, difference. And so how can we do this though? How do we have these atoms, and how do we give them energy, and how do they get rid of energy? And for giving then an electron energy in order for it to jump from the ground state or from le one level to a higher level, there are two ways you can do it then. One would be for a photon to be happening by, and remember photons, light, particles of light, then they have an energy associated with them that's related to the frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the energy, or the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, because energy and wavelength are related by this equation here, where the energy is equal to some constant H, Planck's constant, times the speed of light divided then by the wavelength, and this will not be on the test. This specific equation won't be on the test. But what I want you to think about, though, is this idea that this wavelength, while the light, corresponds to a very, very specific energy, and this is the equation that relates the two. And, of course, the smaller the wavelength, I'm dividing by a smaller and smaller number, the bigger the energy. And so if I have a photon come by that's just the right amount of energy, just the right frequency, right wavelength, right color, right energy that corresponds to this electron being able to absorb it and jump up to this higher energy level, to this first excited state or going from n equals one to n equals two, the electron can do that. It can absorb that photon. If the energy of the photon is too high though, and the electron would end up jumping somewhere here, the electron can't absorb that photon. It just goes right by and the, the electron's just like, nope, 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 can't deal with you. Nope, get out of here. Um, likewise, then, if the energy isn't enough to, to have it jump from the first energy level to the second energy level, and it would end up somewhere in between here, if the wavelength is too long, the energy is too low, likewise, the electron will just let that wave pass by, too, because it can't do anything with it. So that's one way to give the electron energy. Another way to do it, though, is actually in a collision with other atoms, collisions with other atoms, and that's an energy thing. Whack, I've hit, there's you know, X amount of kinetic energy then um, released in the collision. And if that energy involved in the collision then is exactly the right amount, the electron then can also absorb that and jump up to that higher energy state. And it's not gonna like to be there, so that energy, that electron then can jump back down to the ground state then by losing energy. And the only way it can lose energy then is through the emission of a photon, because photons are energy light. It'll emit light then, and the wavelength of that light then um, is going to be related to the energy of that jump down, again, by our equation, which relates energy then to wavelength. And so the electron, not going to like it up here in the second energy level, it's going to jump down to the first energy level, and it's going to get rid of that energy then in the form of light. And this equation then will tell us the relationship then between the energy and the wavelength of light that it gives off. And I should point out, you know, the, ener the electron can be up here in this third energy level and jump down to the ground state. And it'll give off then, that's a bigger jump. It'll give off a higher energy photon. It'll give off a, a shorter wavelength photon, a bluer photon. The bigger the jump, the higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength of the photon. And it doesn't have to go right from a higher energy uh, state then to the ground state. If we're up here in the third energy level then, um, you can jump down to the second energy level, give off some some light, some energy, and then jump from the second energy level to the first energy level. You can take two jumps then uh, to get to the ground state. Or if you're up even higher, you can take three jumps. Uh, so, so the jumping down, it doesn't have to be the one big jump. You can take little jumps, 
couple of little jumps, same as one big jump. What's important though is the jumps down though, the energy involved in that then is what's determining the wavelength, the color, the energy then of the photon then um, that's, uh, that's being given off. All right, so um, with that, I have to take care of something. I know there are a lot of interruptions on this one. I'm sorry, but uh, I will be back shortly. Well, it looks like I was uh, out of time after all. I sat down to, to record a little bit more, and I noticed a clock on the bottom. And, uh, yeah, we'll have to wrap this up. I do think we'll be able to get things done, though. We'll finish uh, Kirchhoff's Laws, this idea of what sort of a spectrum, uh, mission, or continuous, or whatever, do you see under different circumstances. And we'll talk a little bit about the Doppler shift. And that'll bring Chapter 6 to a, to a close. So we should still be able to have that test on uh, uh, Friday through uh through sunday i, I think that'd be uh, a good time to have it so um until wednesday take care and if you haven't read chapter six maybe you should a little bit all right all right i'll see you later